Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Anirban, yeah. thanks for joining me, mate. Always good to catch up every week. Yeah, same here. Pleasure is all mine as well, as I like to say, Owen. So thanks yes. for having me. No, it's, uh, it's always a good, good bit of fun. And we're starting to get a lot more engagement across the podcast. So that's, that's great too. Get people reaching out on Twitter, a uh, few emails that we've received just to say, um, loving the new show. I think a few of our RASP members actually really, really enjoy the show. And um, I think we're creeping up the rankings, which is always good to see, mate. We're, um, you know, we're in the top 10. So, well, into the top 10. yeah. So it seems that people like us just making it up as we go along. <laughs> but we'll take it. <laughs> we'll take it. Actually, this morning, I was giving a, uh, a presentation to the Australian Shareholders Association, I think for the Gold Coast chapter remotely, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, actually, a couple of people mentioned that they, they actually listen to our podcast. Uh, you know, they actually look forward to it. So that's, I, I, I was quite surprised that, you know, people are actually talking about it and they're interested in it. So that's good. You know, as long as people are interested, right, we will do it, right? That's the, I mean... The only reason to do it is if someone is interested, if nobody's interested, then I guess we can still do it because we like talking, <laughs> but it's, it's more useful if, if other people are interested and if they tell us what they want to listen to. So yeah. hit us up on Twitter. Yeah, that's it. That's the place to do it. So um, full full links in the show notes. Um, 7A Mahanti is, is Anebam's uh, Twitter handle. Mine is at Owen Rask. Um, you'll find it in the show notes. So just jump on there, say good day. Tell us what you want to hear. We've um, had a few requests, uh, which we still need to get through. So uh, some, some great things in there. And um, companies like Ordinate, I know was brought up on Twitter, a company that I'm pretty sure you're familiar with and I'm familiar with too. So we can talk about that in the coming weeks. But for today, uh, we've got to talk about the elephant in the room, the Al Australian elephant getting taken over by the one of the US elephants, which is Square in the payment space. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, we'll also talk about Apple's buy now, pay later, um, move is it official we'll talk about maybe even something that i just wanted to quiz you on i got you can't see this if you're listening but uh, i just got myself the new series six apple watch mate um and i noticed you put out a tweet about that last night we're going to give a personal finance hack we're also going to talk about two companies at the end so firstly as always mate what have you been working on the past week anything in particular um you know, like just looking, I'm actually going back to searching for some ideas, I have a watch list um, that I'm sort of trying to work my way through. Lots of interesting companies have actually gone public uh, maybe in the last 18 months or so. So I have a, like a list of things that I want to study and learn about and uh, uh, sort of look through the ones that are less talked about or less known and things like that. That's what I've been doing. Um, I, I quite like the one, you know, the one that I've recommended this month. I really like that one because, again, it's um, an interesting company. Uh, it's small but profitable, growing really quickly with very high margins, you know, margins that would, might make big tech um, green with envy. So uh, th th that's the sort of thing I'm trying to find. Look for those things that are a little bit under the radar, if possible. But yeah, sometimes it's interesting just to look at ideas and see what 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 companies exist and what what's happening. So do, that's what I've been doing. How do you go about it with IPOs? Do you just, do you, how do you kind of filter them? Cause I imagine there's quite a few, like you said lately, do you just kind of create a watch list and then go back to them a few months later or, or do you ever research them in advance of the IPO and then try and get in early? Like, how do you think about that? That's a great question. And or you know what I do is I have a small uh, spreadsheet. It's like a Google Doc uh, that I have of stuff that's interesting to me. Like, you know, here's the thing, right? Hundreds of, you know, there's like SPACs happening and there's like, you know, reverse mergers happening and all those sort of things. The stuff that doesn't interest me, I don't put it on. But if there's a company in say enterprise software space or, you know, financial services space or FinTech, anything that's got tech in it, um, what I would do is I would basically very quickly look up 
the about page of the company. That's my process. You know, I look at the about page of the company, try to get a handle of what they're doing. If that takes my interest, then definitely it goes on the watch list. And I'll try to read the, at least the summary part of the um, S1 or prospectus or whatever, you know, that's been, you know, the num name changes, but it's S1. If it is a, if it's a US and if it's a foreign, foreign company, then it will not be an S1, but it'll be something else, but let's call it an S1, a prospectus. So I would try to read the prospectus, read the summary part to get a good handle on what's going on. So that, that's my, you know, my go-to. The, the other thing I do is I actually look at any results that have been posted. So you don't have to get into an IPO right away, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can let them have a couple of quarters of results. And if the results are like, okay, we printed 200% revenue growth and blah, 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 you know, our margins went up. Well, that's definitely a company I want to have a look. Um, and maybe, and maybe you don't buy it because it's too expensive. But yeah, so that, that's a list, and the list grows because you maybe no, don't, you know, um, manage to study all of them and things like that. Um, and then, of course, there are companies that I personally own, which I don't have on the watch list because I know them, so they, they're always there. In in you know, so it's a little bit of a mix. I like to look at new things, uh, and the other part, enjoyable part, of reading whether it's an annual report or an S one, is just to get a broader demo, like broader out outline of what's going on right so if you for mm -hmm. example are reading about uh, say credit scores then you would learn not just how you know that that credit scores are important but how many credit uh, you know how many players are there in that market how does it work who uses it how is it used how you know when was it invented there's a lot of background knowledge that you can gain um, so I find that quite intriguing because it also you know and then then when you look at a disruptor you can realize okay well these are the things that they're like, you know, trying to change or disintermediate and things like that. So that's sort of my process. It's not a process. It's, it's sort of a journey <laughs> in many ways. I find that the S1s and prospectuses are actually the most candid reports that you get and in depth. I don't know if you find that too, but they're very, very um, conscious. I don't know if it's like a legal requirement to be prescriptive with the sector, or if it's the, the companies in the sector, or if it's, um, even just through the competitive threats, the the gap um, gap reporting in the US is actually a lot more. It's just a lot better than that anyway. Just um, 10Ks and whatever. But I find the prospectus, even if it's a few years old, it's worth going back to, just to find out all the things about the industry, the dynamics, the, the history of the company that you just don't get in a in a 10K where it's straight up here's the result from the year or or whatever. Um, it's also really good um, to read proxy statements as well, but they don't always come out at the same time um that's really interesting so and then so you gave us a bit of a teaser of the, the company being a small cap growing fast um with enviable margins um how about anything else that you've been working on i know you're on a podcast um with the team recently as well yeah so i've been you know i've been i've been talking a lot about uh, what we're going to talk next i guess uh you know after pen squares so i did, did a couple of uh, podcasts i actually did a, a twitter spaces as well about it uh which was quite interesting mm. and uh, um yeah then I, you know, as i said i did a presentation so that present for the australian shareholders association this morning you know it was like a r and something right and that takes time <laughs> to prepare yeah. at least for me it takes time i'm a i'm a slow preparer for presentations like you know, if i have to make 50 slides it's going to take me a while so mm -hmm. i was working on that um yeah lots of bits and pieces and different things uh, to do yeah. uh, plus, plus watching over you know your child who is homeschooling as well so <laughs> there's, mm. there's plenty plenty on the plate right now yeah for sure um I thought we were just talking off air and you mentioned that we should probably talk about it. Uh, one of the Australian companies that I follow closely, which is a company called Volpara. And I think you've spoken to see, um, the CEO and founder, co-founder, uh, Dr. Ralph Heinem. Uh, so the company came out a few a couple months ago, I think it was now, um, and basically said that ARR, annualized recurring revenue, would be ahead or is ahead of what they expect revenue to be, which is those, those, that doesn't really square up because if you have annualized recurring revenue, which is typically based on the most, most recent month's subscriptions, um, that should be at least in line with what you expect revenue to be over the next year because you're just annualizing the last month or, or what have you. And they actually said that um, it was quite substantially above the revenue guidance and they didn't really have an explanation for it. In fact, none at all really. Uh, but they came out last week with another update and it was kind of, it was pleasing, I would say. So the company's reported cash receipts of 6.4 million. Uh, this is for the first quarter of 2022, up 30%. Um, ARR came in at 27.8 million. This is in New Zealand dollars. 
If you convert that to US, that's 19.2, up 600,000. Um, the company, for the first time in quite a while, um, actually increased its market share to 33%, so compared to 32 last quarter. So that's 33% of all women um, in the US that get screening. I should just back it up a bit and just say that Volpara creates the software for breast density um, and for everything that happens when a woman goes into a clinic uh, and gets like a mammogram. Uh, so average revenue per user for the quarter um, was $1.42 or um, $1.55, sorry, just for the quarter. For the entire company, um, it was $1.42, as in um, that's what it was, but at the quarter, it was slightly higher. What's really important when you look at Volpara is that the every quarter, the average revenue per user is going up. And the reason why it's important is because it's effectively a P times Q model. The more women screen at a higher price, there you get your revenue. Um, Really, yeah, so it's really simple as that. Uh, cash outflow, net cash outflow is 3.2 million and they had 29.1 million on, in the bank. Um, I will just say some notes from the call. I was saying it to you off air, we're recording this via Zoom, but I was saying to you that when I was in the call last week and I know a lot of other investors, maybe some listeners were on the call too. And someone logged into the company's Zoom account at the same time the quarterly webinar was on. So just as we got the questions, everyone got booted off, uh, which is quite hilarious. Uh, it's a bit frustrating too, I must add. But um, yeah, so ARPU, uh, average revenue per user was decent, um, but lower than some quarters gone by. The company kind of confirmed that it does not intend to make any meaningful M&A deals going forward. It's made a few in recent years. And the final piece that I'll add is, for those of you who follow Volpara, it's a company I own shares in, the genetics um, aspect of its business. So it's now effectively creating referrals to, to companies uh, to get genetics testing. And that helps women get um, covered for their mammograms and for their therapy um, via insurance. And uh, what's really interesting is Rob confirmed the model. So if you think of Volpara software as kind of like a, a management software for like the, the site or the clinic, um, it kind of takes everything into account. Um, it can provide a view for, for clinicians to see how many people are going through the clinic that day, how the clinic is performing, right down to what is the breast density score. And one of the things that they're doing now is they're effectively out sending out um, requests for genetic testing, um, for risk modeling. And every time they do that, they can put the ticket on the way out. And um, what's also interesting is that there's another kind of model that they have, which is where the genetics company pays Volpara to roll out its software, um, which is really interesting because the genetics company can't pay the clinic directly. So it's a really interesting uh, little situation, but. It's actually allowing the business to uh, send the average revenue per user or per woman up over $5 so per woman's screen. So that's actually a pretty good sign of things to come. Anyway, that's a big rant, mate, but I came away feeling that it was a pretty positive quarter considering that we haven't seen much recently. I know you followed the company closely and you had some words to say just before. Yeah, so I was actually going to talk about but this might be this might be interesting. This might be an educational thing. I was just thinking about it when you're talking about this ARR revenue thing. So the the couple of things you know that happen and this, I actually it can be frustrating when the CFOs can't really explain this. Uh, but I've seen this happen a couple of times. So you can, in certain circumstances, have the ARR being so annual recurring revenue, which you would. You know, it depends on how you're calculating the annual recurring revenue, right? But it's, let's say that your quarter, your your year or half year ended in June, or your full year ended in June, uh, and then you you at that point you look at all the revenue that's recurring, and you analyze that, right? That's your annual recurring revenue. That number actually can be higher mm -hmm. than the total revenue because you might have actually gotten people in. To the to the stream halfway through. That's one way it can happen, but that should be very easy for a, a, a financial chief financial officer to actually explain that that's what's going on. There's another thing that can happen, which is you might get very high um, uh, revenue growth, but your corresponding growth of ARR is actually lagging. Mm. Right, that actually can be worrisome, and that happens again based on uh, revenue recognition models that you're using. Right, so for example, if you have a term contract that you sign up with uh, for say three years, right? So you have a three-year term contract, and let's, for ease of maths, call it three hundred thousand dollars. Now, the rateable model, which is you rateably recognize three hundred thousand over those three years, would mean hundred thousand per year. 
But depending upon the accounting standard that's used, for example, in the US, certain accounting standards would require you to recognize 60% upfront. That would give you then at that point in time a significant lift in revenue mm -hmm. based on your deal size. But yeah, annual recurring revenue is actually the, still the same, right? So again, revenue recognition can have a significant impact on, uh, on what the revenue actually looks like. So I have a hack for this that I think works reasonably well. I actually ignore for, for, for early stage, uh, like recurring revenue style models, I basically ignore revenue altogether. And the reason I do that is there's a lot of mumbo jumbo that will happen between how you recognize the revenue when you're recognizing it. If you are reporting to me the ARR, honestly, which I would assume all companies do because they are audited. And, and if you are giving me the ARR retention rate, so, you know, at least on a recurring revenue basis, if you tell me what the retention or expansion is of that revenue, that I think is a very good proxy as, or at least a firsthand proxy uh, for evaluation, because all you want is that that recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue to, to go up at a steady pace. And you want most of that to be retained. If better yet, you want actually expansion of that to happen. So if for your current cohort, if you're getting $100, you want that cohort to deliver maybe $120 next year, which yeah. is sort of what you alluded to, right? With this $1, like if I, when I was looking at uh, Volpara some time back, I remember that the average revenue per woman was like around $2 something. If you now bump that up to $5, that's very significant expansion, right? Yeah. So I think those are the two metrics I have looked at always Volpara's, I've almost always ignored Volpara's revenue, but again, uh, but sometimes there's, there could be quirks. So the, so that's just a couple of things. This, this came to my mind because there's another company I look at, which has exactly the reverse problem because their revenue seems to be growing at such a fast, where it was <laughs> seemingly growing at such a fast rate uh, compared to their ARR. And, you know, companies love doing this, right? So, you know, when you, if you, have, if, if, if you, you, know, you want to, in your press release, you're gonna say my revenue grew X percentage because that's the higher number, <laughs> right? But then when your revenue is not growing at that pace, you're gonna now say, well, my annual recurring revenue is growing at this percentage, but my revenue is not, right? Uh, and you know, it's just, I think there's, you know, so I think one would avoid that is just focus on one metric. And I guess my bottom line would be, I think you, you, if you focus on one metric, then you choose whichever metric you want, but you want to consistently look at that particular metric mm -hmm. over time. Uh, and that would avoid this re revenue recognition issues, right? Either if, you know, if your revenue recognition has changed, then your revenue and has not changed, then the revenue should track eventually with however ARR is tracking. So just a couple of, you know, maybe nuances to think about there. I like the um, the focus on the net um, expansion rate too. I think that's a really important one. I'll just got, I just got up um, how Volpara defined its ARR. Um, and so this is the normalized amount of cash reasonably expected to be booked for the next 12 months on the basis of the contract signed previously and assuming installation upon order. So basically the normalized amount of cash reasonably expected to be booked. And so that was above what they actually gave in guidance, which, uh, we were, sorry, was below what they gave in guidance. So they gave higher guidance than what they reasonably expected, which was a bit of a an unusual one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, the, the funny thing with this one is, uh, I think this is here. Yeah, this is a small company issue. Well, I have a very interesting story with Volpara. So I recommended Volpara in a service, uh, you know, and the, I think when I recommended it, the stock popped. It popped big time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had actually forewarned them that I'm going to recommend it and I had a conversation with them and so on. And I, and I think, the, you know, that the team is a wonderful team. Mm -hmm. They got into a panic. <laughs> <laughs> because the stock was up so much and they were getting like, they got an email, I think and a ticket from the ASX. <laughs> the stock is up and they, this is the first time that, you know, they got a ticket and they didn't know what to do. And like, okay, so they're sending me email. I said, okay, you know, stuff like that happens. Um, anyways, this was back when they were a really small company, but you see that that is another example of being ultra, like, I mean, what does that normalized expect? There's so much, ifs and buts in that, like, I mean, I can't actually tell what you're telling me from there. You know, why isn't it, why isn't it simply, this is the amount of revenue that we have signed contracted out, um, you know, that's signed in contract. And yes, we realize that some contracts might fall through, but that's the contracted revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And 
all I need to know is this is the contracted revenue for the, for the next year. And that's, you know, that's your annual recurring revenue. And then you tell me what your churn rate is. We are done, right? But there's a lot of ifs and buts there. Yeah, normalized can work both ways, right? Depending on what you're exactly. doing, where you want it to go. Yeah. What is your normalization? I mean, you know, it's a definition. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Volpara, ASX, VHT, um, an interesting company. I think we both own shares in. Um, but, yeah, it's um, just after scratching the surface there. So go and, go and tell us what you think about Volpara on Twitter. Um, mate, I know you've done this, this chat before, so maybe I'll throw it over to you, which is just after pay getting taken over by Square, um, I think at one time on our Rask Media website, the top three articles were all based on this one takeover offer. Um, and so maybe you can just answer it from the perspective of kind of like what's happened, like the 30,000 foot view or from where, where Square sits, why this makes sense and, and what's happened so far. Okay, so the thirty thousand. Let's even make it a sixty thousand foot view, right? So, I mean, I mean, the, the bigger picture is, uh, and this is, I think, you know, I tweeted about this. And th this is really an Australian success, right? I mean, it, and I'm not saying it's a success because it's in being taken over. Uh, I'm saying it's a success because this is an Australian export, you know, an idea, then turned into a technology company that has been exported to the world. So, buy now, pay later is a category, right? And it's a category invented by Afterpay. So you know, an afterpay it is a verb, right? So those those are, um, mm. and I'll actually shout out to a person you interviewed, uh, Ryan Newman. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> the reason I'm going to give you the shout out is, uh, you know, I, I always looked at afterpay with the lens of credit. And, you know, it's basically revolving credit, but there's a lot of other niceties involved, right? So there are consumers involved, and then there are merchants involved, right? And there's, mm. there's, um, there's this nice little network effect happening, you know, more consumers bringing in more retailers to participate, right? And it's a nice self-fulfilling thing. So uh, Ryan Newman, he, you know, he said, you know, what about, you know, looking at this company? I said, ah, you know, I'm not really, this is a credit company. I'm not into credit. Mm -hmm. And then he said, okay, let me go build a model. So I said, no, you know, so only Ryan Newman would go build a model of a company like Afterpay. He built me a model and said, okay, look at this. And I said, whoa, okay, I really missed some things here. Um, so, you know, full credit, to Ryan Newman to actually convince me otherwise uh, to think about, um, uh, to, to, to change my view on Afterpay from being yeah. a bear uh, of it. And I think there's a lot of bears out there on Afterpay because I think, you know, you have to look really to understand the model and the model and why it appeals, right? So putting that aside, so after, by now pay later is a category and that category has taken off because everybody from PayPal to Apple is now talking about mm. it, right? And they're not the only players. So there's a firm, there's Klarna. There is, of course, we have gazillion uh, competitors here on the on the ASX, right? So there is Zip. Um, mm. isn't, isn't there, there's another one, Hum, right? So Sizzle. there's a lot, says hey. heaps. Heaps of companies are competing in this space. And this, you know, if you take an even broader view, this could be a, this could be a, um, um, a, a clarion call saying anti-credit card, right? If a large number of people say that they won't buy now, pay later type of credit, they want light credit checks and light amount of credit that they revolve on, not credit card debts that you can rack up. This really changes the game. Sure. That's it. what it looks like. And a large number of companies therefore want to participate in this because consumers want it. So a square, which is a, you know, you can think of square as a new bank, right? So square yeah. uh, has, uh, you know, um, these small little square white little square beautiful looking things that you know people in farmers markets used to take money and you know small medium businesses use that to take money then square has also got this cash app which is basically um a peer-to-peer -peer money transfer thing you know you can store your bitcoins it's actually used for trading so it's it's an it's it's a consumer uh, app for money and money related applications they even allow a, a savings account there so Square is now seeing that, well, a lot of their sellers uh, or merchants are asking whether or not buy now, pay later can be supported. Square is also seeing that buy now, pay later is being supported by people like PayPal. Mm. So now, of course, Square could go out and start building its own buy now, pay later offering, or you could, you know, you could have a happy marriage with someone like Afterpay, which would bring 16 odd, 20 million odd, I think 16 million odd consumers mm give them complementary expansion, right? So, you know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, uh, coastal US, um, UK uh, expansion. And, 
the other interesting thing is that Square is focused on sort of the small to medium scale enterprise, you know, merchants trying to go upscale to larger enterprises, whereas uh, Afterpay is largely a large retail exposure company, right? So they do deals with retail chains. So it is very complementary in that sense. It helps and uh, gives uh, Square an entry into this sector that is potentially could be, you know, become uh, if a big deal in the years to come. And, um, you know, in, uh, I think, you know, that's, that's the idea. It's, 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 it's a way to fend off competition to stay relevant with the new, you know, new things that people want. Mm. And, and of course, then there are other things that can happen, which, you know, uh, Afterpay is already talking about, which is like using its consumer app, for example, as a retail lead, right? So online shopping from Afterpay's app is, is another possibility, right? I mean, you know, if it's an actively used app, that is always a, you know, it can be used for advertising, it can be used for retail leads, it can be used for online shopping and so much more, right? So uh, I think that's that's the, the deal. I think it's a little bit of, I guess another way to put it is the competition, there's a lot of competition coming. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows about that and Afterpay knows about that and Square knows about that. And it therefore is almost like a marriage that you know is very convenient because if you, instead of trying to fight the battles on your own, maybe the two, you know, maybe your philosophies that align and therefore the two together is, is a very strong force and you can take on the competition. So that's, that's how I look at it. Do you think, do you think, um, after pay would be giving up too early? Um, well, no. So I said no, because I mean, okay, so if you think about the current shareholders, they're getting a darn good price, right? Let's say, and you know, the square shares. So it's a, first of all, it's a script deal, right? So you, after pay shareholders get square shares. Mm-hmm. I think whatever point, Three or some number of shares, point yeah, three or point yeah. three, point three seven five, I think, right? So you you have full opportunity to participate in uh, in the upside via Square, and Square is a pretty innovative company. I've held shares, and you know, I've held them since like 26, 2018, and you know, they're already like a four bagger or something like that. Uh, and and you know, that that's a fast growing company itself. So that's another way to participate in. So that's number one. Uh, number two is that even if you don't, if you've held you know, these shares from anywhere around the $10 mark, I mean, you've made, you know, 10, 12 X already. So, I mean, right. And I, I think it's a strategically smart move in the sense that while you're the leader, this is a, so, so I think the risk for Afterpay as a standalone company is that your service becomes a feature of others. Whereas I think the potential of being with another um, financial, uh, another, merchant seller consumer ecosystem is that instead of becoming just a feature you are a feature that gets added to the other features which make everything in totality more useful right so i think that's the advantage that uh, that i think comes from this so i don't think it's a i think it's it's a great deal it's a great price it's the largest deal ever i think in australian history and if you think about the time in which it happened uh, you know this is what a seven eight year old company um you know I mean, this is as good as it gets, right? And you could say that this is like, you know, has some echoes of dot coms and things like that. You know, quite possible. I mean, it's a $30 billion US uh, buyout or $29 billion US buyout. It's a pretty significant buyout. So mm. um, I almost look at this as a merger because you're getting a script. Uh, it's, you know, so they're using their expensive stock to, you know, swap for another expensive stock. Mm. <laughs> so it's, it's a merger of kind. The, 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 the founders and the CEO, uh, they're coming on board, you know, maybe they have a future in this company, maybe they lead Square uh, into its next journey. I mean, Jack Dorsey really is a hands-off CEO, right? I mean, he he almost wants, he said, once he said he was going to spend most of his time in Africa, uh, you know, and he's going to let other people run his company and he's going to just be on Zoom calls or whatever it is. <laughs> so, um, so maybe there's a leadership void thing too. So I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a great, uh, deal. Uh, I don't, you know, it's a great deal for shareholders. I think the only question mark I'd throw, and I don't know what you think about this, but I, the only question mark as a square shareholder I can ask is, is square paying too much? Mm. That's the question, I think, in my mind. Mm. I have a good answer, but um, what, what's your thought? I'm, I'm interested in what you think, because you have stayed quiet. Yes, yes, I have. Um, I don't know, I was just trying to take in everything. Uh, so 
full disclosure, I actually passed on Square shares at about $38 in the 270 odd now. And that was only about 18 months ago. So I thought the, um, to be honest, I thought the asset component of, and the kind of financing component of Square was a bit of an issue. It's since kind of rolled off and there's no problem. Um, I was, yeah, I, as a PayPal shareholder, I always kind of look across the fence at Square and I really like what they're doing. I like the cash app. Um, I like the terminals. It's, and if I think about it from a Square, I'm not a Square shareholder, but if I was, and I was thinking about it from your situation, your perspective, what I would think is that Afterpay takes Square firmly into omni-channel um, e-commerce or just e-commerce. So what I mean by that is traditionally people know Square as, like you say, farmers markets, even the cash app like peer-to-peer, um, maybe trading and that type of stuff. But if Afterpay is even a, a mild success in the US, which it already has kind of proven that it is, um, and it's getting more attention now. I think that CNBC article that you sent me is kind of trying to explain what um, buy now, pay later is to people to that read CNBC. And I was like, what are you talking about? It's been around for like five years. Um, anyway, so uh, I think if they can leverage what the momentum that Afterpay already has and push themselves further into the e-commerce um, space, I think this is going to be a massive win-win um, in terms of they're going to get that presence online and in store and i think the next iteration to your point earlier on how they combine the apps if they combine the apps would probably that's probably going to be a really interesting thing from a technology and user experience perspective in terms of afterpay is such a powerful app in itself at least here in australia and merging in the us but squares cash app is obviously more popular in the us so how do they combine those two is it the feature gets put into square but they keep the afterpay app and then from the Afterpay app, you can get more features. Um, I don't know. I think that's a really interesting thing. So I think overall, the deal makes a whole heap of strategic sense. I was chatting to some guys around the office and I was wondering if PayPal knew this was coming. Um, because if they did, wonder, I wonder if they thought about it. Because they obviously, we spoke a lot, uh, last week or the week before that Apple, PayPal, all these giants are moving into the buy now, pay later space. I wonder if they knew this deal was coming, if they tried to do something in the Australian market to try and preempt it in any way. I really don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just a conspiracy theory that I've been staying up too late on my computer, Googling what insiders know and I don't. But you know, overall, mate, I think it's a great deal. I think it's good that Australian shareholders still get that exposure because um, while well, one, it's better for Square because you're paying script. If you can monetize in a low interest rate world, um, it makes, deal, it makes sense to buy a business that can compound capital really quick, like Afterpay can. Um, the, other, the other component is that it gives current shareholders a way to participate in a really good company. I think you would make the decision now to sell if you didn't think that Square was a market beating idea. Um, and I think for the founders too, it gives them a chance to exit at least some of their position um, in, a, in, a, in a liquid way. So I don't know, that's just my summary thoughts. Um, I don't own shares. Uh, fantastic for everyone that, that does own Afterpay shares. Um, it will be a shame to see that you don't see the Afterpay ticker on the ASX, but at the same time, you're getting square. So that all of a sudden opens up that investment idea as a, as a CDI, I believe. So yeah, I don't know. that's just some summary thoughts. Um, I don't know, I, 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 zooming back out again, um, we, we spoke about Apple the other week. I, I just feel like, so we've been looking at some payment companies here in Australia and I've been watching PayPal's results. Um, they dropped last week and, and we spoke about that, but those results were almost soft in a way. Um, we saw PayPal's um, take rate, its net margin get squeezed a bit um, as the eBay kind of marketplace deal rolls off. And um, I don't know, maybe it's like a post COVID blues, but I don't know, I feel like maybe there are some bigger things at play here with Apple and, and the digital wallets moving into the space. I don't know, maybe again, I'm jumping at shadows, but I don't know if you've had any updated thoughts on where Apple is in this, this big um, ecosystem. Yeah, so, so just before I, I, I go there, I think this this blues, update blues thing, a lot of companies saw Amazon's results too. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, the forward guidance, for example, was soft. Right. So they and they, what they're saying is, 
uh, basically you saw this, you know, there was, there was a 20%, let's say growth, and then there was huge demand, which took them some time to ramp up facilities and people and infrastructure to support the demand. So then, then you saw 30%, 40% growth. And now the reopening is happening in uh, reopen, reopening has happened in the US and parts of Europe. That thing is rolling off and, and people are doing other things that they were not doing. And therefore the demand should normalize, in which case they're expecting that you know their year over year comps are going to be really hard. So there's a little bit of that happening. Uh, I haven't followed uh, the PayPal e, uh, e eBay deal to know much about it. So I, I'll reserve I'll, um, my thoughts on that. The, the only thing I'll say about take rates, a take rate, they, I mean, payments overall is a hugely, hugely competitive area, right? Mm -hmm. And and I mean, for whatever you say, you're a PayPal shareholder, right? So I mean, PayPal's take rates are still, you know, if you compare with somebody like Aiden, um, <laughs> the take rates are unbelievably higher, right? So the the there is uh, there's some element of that stickiness of the system, but again, you know, your margin is my opportunity sort of thing that works, right? So if if your take rates are higher than other people's take rates, then you know, competition would eventually erode some of that. Uh, how can I put it yeah. in real quick? Um, yeah. PayPal actually did a really interesting thing um, in their quarterly, which were, it kind of it caught me off guard. Um, they said, and I've got the number here, they effectively said, we're going to increase prices um, in the face of competition because they said that if you go to a checkout, um, they've got some commissioned research from Nielsen, which suggests that if you go to a checkout, um, Consumers are three times more likely to complete a deal if they see a PayPal branded checkout versus an unbranded checkout that just has like Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. So they're actually increasing their prices in the face of competition. So I think we're going to find out in the next year or so if that PayPal brand still has strength mm. and has pricing power. And I think that's going to be really interesting because this is the this is the OG in terms of e-commerce gateways. You would see the PayPal logo and you'd be like, okay, I know it's safe. Mm. So I wonder, I mean, that's going to be, I find that's going to be interesting to play out over the next year. If, it, if they pull it off, then they'll be able to prove that you can still, even in the face of intense competition, you can still have a business that squeezes, uh, widens its margin at the checkout, which would be really impressive. Anyway, I thought it was that, injected. That is, that, is, that is fantastic. Actually, if that happens, that will be, that, that'll be sort of the antithesis mm. of uh, what people would expect, right? You'd expect margins would contract over time, but if it doesn't, that means they have a brand, the, you know, the, the brand power there to do it. So that, that'll be super interesting, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. So I, I think uh, on on Apple and Buy Now Pay, that's just right now what I saw and what I tweeted out was a rumor that Buy Now Pay later, they're gonna, I guess, soft launch it in Canada mm. as a test. Um, yeah. so, yeah. so I think there's a couple of things I would, one thing that at least I'll talk about for a company like Apple, actually, this is true for PayPal too, I think, although without, I don't know PayPal that well, but my understanding with PayPal's buy now pay later is that they are not charging the retailer. No, they're, uh, not. they're not right. So, which basically means they're just giving the customer the opportunity to just, you know, basically pay in installments. So they're actually in some sense, taking a hit, they're not making money off it. Mm. It's a feature for them for essentially their larger ecosystem to be healthy. I think that's the same thing for someone like Apple. Apple also is not probably gonna look, you know, app for Apple, it'll be okay. I'll offer buy now, pay later. I'll still take my cut off Apple Pay and that's it, mm. right? So then broadly speaking though, I, I still think it doesn't mean that Afterpay and the likes are disrupted because there's nothing that says that it's like, you know, well, I have a MasterCard, I have a Visa card, I can have an American Express. Well, why wouldn't I have an Apple Pay, an Afterpay, um, you know, PayPal Pay and everything else that, you know, well, if I can have them, I might as well have them. And maybe what it means is that the bank cards are being replaced by these other cards. And, and that's a possibility. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. Now, the, the question would be with, yeah, Sorry, go ahead. I was say, do you think then, so say fast forward five years from now, are you saying that there's a reality where like how we have, they say, I bank with ING, I also have a bank of Melbourne card. Are you saying like our wallet's full of a, of a couple of these things rather than say it's all or nothing with Apple Pay? That we say? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, right now we have a lot of different cards, credit cards and things like that from different banks. I think, you know, maybe 
there's a shift, a slow shift maybe, towards wallet, digital wallets owned by technology companies and financial services companies. Mm. That comes at the cost of wallets. You know, like, you know, the common bank CEO would complain about, oh, they can't do stuff with the wallets and things like that because yada, 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 uh, because they don't have access to the secure enclave and things like that and, and whatnot. I mean, my point is that even if you had access to a secure enclave, maybe you're still on the way out <laughs> because being, you're being replaced by other things. That's, I think, the reality. Uh, that's the way I think it is trying, it's starting to play out. So I don't know. I mean, it's going to be fascinating to watch. There's lot, lots of stuff happening in payments, which makes the payments area very interesting. Mm. Yeah, I just think, um, yeah, I'm very, I'm, as we spoke about last week, very happy to be an Apple shareholder right now. Um, speaking of, there's actually something else I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, people that are listening can't see this, but I'm actually wearing a Mickey, Mickey Mouse t-shirt and I've got um, the Mickey Mouse uh, face on my apple watch ah, the weekend. yes so it's a, it's a branded wednesday mate um themed wednesday i should say and so um you tweeted something yesterday which was that the apple watch the series six which i've got can do ecgs and all different types of things uh, and basically they're increasing the usefulness of these these things that wrap around the wrist and based but obviously you're the man to ask here in terms of computing and mobile computing and just in terms of innovation generally speaking where do you see the role of these wearables and technology generally speaking in our lives now and where do you see it going yeah so that's a great question so yeah the one i was t- tweeting about was the, so this capability to do ecg has been there on apple yeah, watch since i think series four or five it was not approved in australia by tga while well, it was approved in a bunch of other countries including in new zealand so new zealand got it before yeah. kiwi folks got it before us uh so i'm just <laughs> i'm just knocking on TGA <laughs> saying well you know if if the kiwis approved it you, you could have at least just copied them uh, uh for, <laughs> for whatever reason they didn't approve it we were among you know probably the 70th country to get it um and i was just delighted and actually i found this out because my wife came home and said oh you know her her niece this basically is, it was showing off um the you know the uh ecg capability i said what 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 you you know your niece this basically was showing off the ecg said, yeah on the apple watch and i said yeah but it, it doesn't work he said well then i then i thought i'll give it a look and they said ah it has finally the update has come so <laughs> That's why I was excited about it because I've been looking forward to this. For so, uh, there is a comment Tim Cook has made a number of times, and I think this is true. He said that Apple's biggest contribution to society is going to be in healthcare, mm. right? And I think he doesn't mean he doesn't mean that they're going to do some healthcare app or you know telehealth or anything like that. What he means is over time, they're going to build these wearables and things, you know, and our computers around us that that is, that is going to do a lot of heavy lifting. So what he means is your health app on, if you're an Apple user, is going to have such amount of wealth of data that that can be actually on device, do wonderful things. So today itself, you know, an Apple Watch can do fall detection. It can do oxygen saturation measurements, right? Which is, you know, if you, if, for example, if you're affected with COVID, that's one of the things you want to measure, ox- mm-hmm. oxygen saturation levels. Um, uh, then you can do ECG, right? And none of these are, you can think of them as not necessarily medical grade, but they're pretty darn good. And they serve the purpose of people being more aware of mm-hmm. their health, right? And that is basically making, you know, so if you see some problem with, you know, your O2 levels or your problems with your health, you're going to probably go to your talk to your doctor, you're going to probably exercise, you're going to use the Apple Watch to, you know, I think that is contribution. And I, that's why I like Apple as a company, that its purpose is really improvement over time uh, for people's health. And, and I think Apple Watch, you know, probably I would not be surprised to see a, a blood glucose meter on it mm. without, without prick, mm. right? So, and that would be fantastic. Just imagine, you know, and and Australia is actually a very healthy country, you know, so we don't have that level of, you know, diabetes and things like that. But in some countries, this is like an endemic, right? Mm. Um, And having this feature would be life-saving for people. So I think, I I really think wearables have a, a long and very important role to play in healthcare. And... Yeah, I think Apple's, you know, you can just keep, you can just expect each iteration to just bring more 
you know, and, and the other thing I'll point out is like, you know, right now the limitation is silicon, right? So, you know, we're doing uh, five nanometers is sort of the best tech that exists. Then that's used by the Apple, uh, you know, the latest Apple iPhones, five nan nanometer technology for building their uh, the chips. But as the nanometer goes down to say two or one, where does it really help? It really helps on devices like, so when I said, you know, you know, it's going to help on devices where you want to do small things like sonar wrist, right? Mm. So I, I think, you know, again, we've got some ways to go, but. I think um, TSMC is working or producing three nanometers now, um, which is, yeah, which is kind of just mind boggling. Um, I, I've actually got to reflect on something that I forgot to mention before. It's actually, I spoke to the CEO of QuickFee last week, which is a small cap payments gateway company here in Australia. And they're actually got a new CEO in the US based out of Houston. And um, he was saying that the game there is not payment like paying there and then, it's actually when they have the conversations with customers and they're there with corporate customers, even the corporate customers want to know how can my B2B customers pay with buy now, pay later. And then they get in the door with buy now, pay later, and then they offer the full suite of services. Anyway, and another CEO that I talked to, I'm gonna bring one up, just keep uh, kind of name dropping here. Uh, but I spoke to Rob Wong, who is the CEO of a company called Control Bionics. And they do, um, it's a company we've recommended um, in the past. And, and what they do here in Australia is they um, create something called a neuro node, which looks like a watch. Like think about my Apple watch right here, but a little bit bigger and it can go on any part of the body. And it does EEG and surface um, electromyography, I think it's called. Um, and basically I said to him, well, why doesn't Apple just buy you out? And he's like, to be honest, that's kind of the way that it's going is that if you can get these signals clearer, um, whichever way you can do that and you can make the device smaller you can put it anywhere at any time and it's not just people with you know severe um i guess challenges physically that need these things it's also people like us that are able-bodied and can use these things but i chose the series six watch mate because i um, have heart issues in my family so i thought well it might be worth having it anyway um so that's why i chose it but i i i feel like this is a fascinating thing and i feel like the other the competitors are there, but they haven't really got the scale that Apple has. Um, I'll give you a neat hack. I don't know if you do this because I don't know how big of a fan you are of um, Google and its privacy. But if you have a, a Gmail account, there's actually you can go into your calendar and you can set like a regular workout or um, health routine that you just set up. And Google will actually automatically see what's in your work calendar and determine the best time of day, depending on your calendar, when you should do your half an hour workout. And then if you don't do the workout, then it automatically adjusts the calendar for next week, depending on your habits. And what I found out last night is that the Apple Watch automatically syncs with Google's calendar. So it automatically records all of my stats um, and determines when I should be working out, which is pretty cool, uh, I gotta say. So I was, I was geeking out a bit about that. But hey, mate, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about big tech. Um, we've got one more personal finance thing here, which we'll kind of scratch in our heads to try and figure out